Okay, so thank you for being here. Uh, I will make the final round today with my talk on how to go from exploration to production or to deployment and where I will show how we can combine TensorFlow with PyTorch in order to bridge the gap between rather explorative tasks and deployment tasks and which frameworks are going to assist us with that. First, a few words about myself. So um, I'm a data scientist. I work for Innovex since almost approximately two years now, including my master thesis, which I wrote there. Originally, I studied here in Karlsruhe at the KIT, uh, industrial engineering, uh, with a focus on rather quantitative fields like operations research, computer science, and statistics. And I'm a big fan of uh, deep learning and recommender systems, especially the combination of both. So this is what that DL, uh, DLRS is about. And um, if you like to do something else during that talk, or if you like to follow up on all the material, just find the blog post, which is associated with that talk, as well as the GitHub repository uh, just there linked. So, um, yeah, it's a two blog post series, pretty comprehensive, but, uh, yeah, it guides you through the whole process, which I try to compress in a few slides here. Yeah, and as I said, that I'm uh, really big into recommender systems and deep learning. There was something quite surprising to me that... Uh, the hotel I'm staying with thinks that this is the right magazine for me. And even a day afterwards, they still had the same confidence. Okay, so this is what I try to help people personalize according to their customers. And sometimes it works. And sometimes, as you see, that doesn't work. Um, what is Innovex? So we are an IT project house based in Cologne, uh, not based in Cologne. Um, so our main base is kind of in Karlsruhe, but it was kind of correct that it's based in Cologne because I work in Cologne. Uh, we have different offices across Germany as well as in uh, Hamburg and Munich. Um, and we do some kind of all kinds to help our uh, customers to digitally transform. So I rather work in data science, but we also do application development and IT operations. Okay, so much to the advertising. Now let's talk content. So this will be my agenda for today. First, I will give you just a short motivation why I think this topic is important and why we should pay attention to it. Um, which technologies there are in order to help us to reach our goal and show you just three approaches that I took in order to show that you can easily go from exploration to production and get your models into the wild. And this is kind of structured into three tasks. So this is first the explorative task, second the translation task, and third it's the deployment itself. And finally, just show you a short and uh, small comparison between the approaches that I took, wrapping up with a conclusion and showing you some outlook or also some wishes I have for the community or where I think people can further contribute to. Okay, so let's start um, with kind of the motivation. So this is why I went for that topic. Um, I think we see a lot of blog posts uh, of people who are talking, hey, I use this work uh, or this network in order to solve the MNIST task. Or uh, there are many papers uh, that are appearing constantly about new stuff in data science or in artificial intelligence in general. There are many, many POCs and many people luckily trying it out out themselves. But on the other hand, this is at least um, kind of my view on it, there's less attention paid to framework interoperability. So there are different frameworks out there about how to combine them and how to let people use their favorite ones, but also make them combine their results with the results of others that might adhere to other frameworks. Uh, we see less data science really taken into production or at least publicly um, or just to see people who show POCs not also showing them how they deployed things. And um, there's also another famous person, Andrew Ink. Most of you, I assume, might have heard about him who also kind of um, 
yeah, dropped into that topic and uh, he kind of coined the term of AI being the new electricity. Uh, and whether you agree or disagree with that, uh, there's some kind of analogy if you compare AI with, um, with electricity. So in electricity, if we look into an electrical energy system, we have kind of three parts it consists of. It's a generation side, we have the transmission side, separated into transmission and distribution, and we have the consumption side. And I like to take that analogy of electricity and also compare it to models. So first we start creating models and iterating on them, see which models perform best. This is what I would relate to as model exploration. And then we kind of sometimes face a gap because we have to take these models into production, but production frameworks are different. They do not support the frameworks we explored with. So there might be a task of translation, how to bring them into a deployable format. And finally, of course, there's a deployment to make people really consume what we created and to serve the people with AI. And this is also what Andrew Inc. mentioned. He said, go out there and try to transform people's lives with these things. And this requires that you offer people something useful. And this, I think, adheres to the point of go finally into deployment or serve something. Yeah, but looking into these three subparts, exploration, translation, and deployment, there's already a lot out there. So most of you, I would say, are quite confident with these things we have in the exploration domain. So we have many frameworks there for um, de doing deep learning uh, across different languages, um, especially Python is kind of, or it is the most used language for doing data science. We have TensorFlow, which is quite mature already. We have PyTorch that already released its version 1.0 uh, as a pre-release. We had that great talk yesterday about it. Uh, but we has, have also different ones like Keras that is built on top of um, on top of TensorFlow and so on. So we can do a lot and use a lot of different networks or not dif different networks, different uh, frameworks that support us in exploring. So what do we have in order to translate them into a target format? There, um, there are quite new developments. On the upper side, we have ONNX, which stands for the Open Neural Network Exchange Format that is um, kind of establishing itself. And we have NNAF uh, that was uh, published by Kronos just um, a few months ago. And um, I will elaborate on them uh, in the further slides. And on the deployment side, we also have different things you might have come across. So we had that talk of yesterday um, with um, the, I can't remember his name, but it was from Ruru with, um, with Firefly that was pretty nice and great just to get a nice um, web service API in order to serve your everything you do kind of in Python. Um, and he used Flask uh, together with GUnicorn. But it's also that kind of frameworks we use for exploration have capabilities to deploy. For example, TensorFlow. So TensorFlow has a built-in uh, model server. It's called TensorFlow Serving. And this supports us not only in exploration, but also in deployment. But there is also a new one, which I will elaborate on, that is GraphPipe. And finally, if we have that specific formats we can deploy, it's about, OK, um, what do we use? Mostly we go for Docker and then where do we go, for example, into the cloud or something like that? Okay, there will be three approaches I will have a look into. So the first will be, let's start with PyTorch, because at least I think that PyTorch is easy to start with for beginners. Uh, it's nice to iterate on because it really, really well integrates with NumPy and lets you do a lot quickly, which also means you can fail quickly. That also means you learn quickly. And even as I think quicker as you do in TensorFlow, nevertheless, TensorFlow is useful as well. So we start with PyTorch. Then we use ONNX to translate our model into a general format. And finally use GraphPipe and the GraphPipe um, Docker container to serve it. The second one uh, starts with the same two um, steps, and then we will go for TensorFlow serving 
also, uh, also use it within a Docker container and serve our model. And the final one will be rather a hobbyist approach where I just build my own Flask web service and try to integrate a model inference within that web service in order to serve my model. And then if you like to go, you can also deploy them, for example, in the Google Cloud or somewhere else. So I think there is something missing here. We talked about model exploration, translation, and deployment. But it doesn't start with models because models need to build, to be built up on something. And yeah, this is data. So let's start with data exploration first. So, and in terms of data exploration, um, I'm kind of, yeah, uh, bored by seeing MNIST the thousandth time. This is why I went for something different called MNIST. But it's just a little different. <laughs> So we are not kind of trying to classify only the 10 digits we have. We are also trying to classify letters, capital and um, non-capital uh, letters. So we try to go for, in total, 62 classes. You can do the math by yourself. And there are six different splits we have. And kind of the greatest split um, is also quite unbalanced. So if you look to the right, we have many digits. So almost 400,000 of these 28 by 28 pixel images are, um, are um, digits, which just make about 10 of the 62 classes. And the rest is yeah, kind of equally split in uppercase and lowercase letters. So and there are just a few examples that you can see here. So it goes beyond only digits and makes the whole task a little more complicated. Yeah, because you can think about it, differentiating an O from a zero might be more complicated as to differentiate between zero and nine or something like that. So we also, among the letters, see a big unequal distribution, just how letters are used in language. But this won't be none of our concerns. This is not a talk about data science and going deep into how to classify things, how to tweak things, or how our data looks like. It's just a few or a short um, inspiration for you if you would just also go beyond general data sets like, like MNIST. So, for example, try classifying characters. And by characters, I mean letters um, together with, uh, with digits. Okay. But I talked about PyTorch. So let's have a closer look into PyTorch. As I said, there's already that pre-released version. And um, I'm a big fan of it. Although I started with TensorFlow when I did my first steps and sometimes found TensorFlow to be complicated or difficult to debug. For PyTorch, you can just go there and print a tensor and you directly get the what's in it, which makes you, as I said, fail fast and thereby learn fast. And what's also nice about it, it has ONNX support integrated, which means that Using PyTorch, training your model, you can directly export a generic representation of your trained model and then afterwards try to deploy it. And I also hope the same for TensorFlow, which is among PyTorch, they form the two most used um, deep learning models. And there was also that announcement of TensorFlow 2.0, and they kind of announced that there will be some support for more platforms or languages, and I hope a lot that ONNX will be one of these frameworks, and that they are also going to integrate ONNX into their, into their framework to also support to that interoperability, which I think facilitates uh, data science work and contributes to the, to the community a lot. So I hope for that. We will see that soon. Okay, but now as we did our data exploration and argued for PyTorch, let's start with the three main steps. So let's go for model exploration. And as I said, this is pretty easy. So you just go there, you define your graph, um, then you instantiate your model loss and optimizer. So it's kind of the standard setting you take if you go for these classification tasks. And then you try to do the heavy lifting and go for training. And this is what we see. So we are not doing that bad. So given that we have uh, 62 classes, we are kind of 
classifying correctly two thirds of them. Um, as you can see here, so the blue line is the test set and I have to confess I uh, did not evaluate um, on the whole test set so I took 5% out of them. Um, but finally this was would be what you of course would do do the evaluation on the whole test set. But this, as I said, is just for an exploration. And we see, okay, this seems quite satisfying, but maybe we can go further. And um, there, PyTorch makes it pretty easy. Just change your graph definition, iterate on it. And yeah, this is kind of the standard approach you would go for. Add more layers, make your model more complex and thereby to capture more of the underlying uh, relations between input and output data. Of course, you can dig deeper into that, but as I said, we are trying to deploy things here. So how well does that perform? Ah, uh, and okay, it does better. So now we are approximately at 80%, uh, which of course leads us to, let's go for the deeper neural network um, and not for the shallow version and use that three layer network we trained and try to deploy it and not try to iterate many, many times on it because let's just adhere to Pareto who said 80-20. Okay, so... Having done the exploration task, we can step into the next task, and that will be translation. And there I just mentioned there is that cool new framework out there, uh, the Open Neural Network Exchange format that is supported by Amazon, Facebook, and Microsoft, so um, faces some great support and maybe, of course, thereby some more or bigger um, spreading across the whole community and other frameworks, especially TensorFlow. And um, as I said, it's integrated in some of these um, in some of these standard frameworks, especially into PyTorch. But nevertheless, because people still find TensorFlow serving quite useful, which I think is uh, is the case, um, people build connectors for TensorFlow or, for example, for Apple's Core ML. And therefore, we can also use it with TensorFlow. So how does it look like or how does the first ex how does the first export step look like? And this is pretty neat. So we just go there and um use tens of uh, use torch. So um first we imported it and as I said ONNX is imported into torch. We trained our network and as we sa uh, have seen yesterday um for example if you want to go from PyTorch eager mode into PyTorch script. It works via tracing and we also see that here. Tracing means that in order to record which operations are performed, we need to provide an example input. So this is why we just create an example input here. So we take just some random numbers that are flattened. So this 784 just relates to the flattened image. And then we pass this input through our network tell it where it should save it under which name and we can also add some some further um, denominations for the operations that are within the model to make them being exported as well so and after we performed that step we have a generic representation of our trained model along with the graph structure with the trained variables that we can then use in other frameworks as well and there, the first step, as I said, will be GraphPipe. So what is GraphPipe? GraphPipe is even younger as ONNX is. So it was published in mid-August this year by Oracle. Um, it's open source. And um, its main goal is to facilitate the whole deployment process. It builds up on different um, model servers. So it integrates Cafe2, it integrates TensorFlow Serving, and uses another format for serialization and deserialization. So for example, in TensorFlow, you have that protocol buffers where GraphPipe uses flat buffers, which makes it partially more efficient. And what they also did, especially for TensorFlow serving, they quite kind of tweaked the standard parameters. So they kind of do a lot of manual work that we won't have to do anymore. And by this, they facilitate the whole deployment process. And um, they also offer client implementations for Go, Python, and Java. So these clients we just use then to send REST, um, REST queries against our web service that is offered by GraphPipe 
within a Docker container. So how does it look like? So as I said, GraphPipe just acts on top of different model service and we have TensorFlow. Uh, we have the um, PyTorch Cafe 2 here. And this is what we are going to try. So we have a generic representation of our model. And now let's go for that approach. Let's try to use our model trained in PyTorch, export it with ONNX and try to serve it within GraphPipe wrapping ONNX. So this means we just have to provide the ONNX file and then let it serve the file, make it queryable. Uh, so sounds simple and I went for it and uh, we will see how that went. So there's some additional thing we need to provide and this is a JSON-like representation of the model input. So um, there was no explicit documentation on this part, so I try and kind of try to follow up on their example case they, pr they provided. So, and this uh, seemed uh, yeah, pretty good to me. So we have our tensor here, and this kind of stands for the batch size, I would assume. Um, so this is how they structured their example, but unfortunately they are still pretty sparse on their documentation. But also they are just out there since August. So yeah, keep calm. Um, yeah. And what we do is just we download that Docker container, uh, reference our trained model that is, that is here. So we see, no, it's here. And of course our JSON format that kind of describes the model input and serve it under port 9000. And let's see how that works. It didn't. So we are kind of uh, seeing a problem with Cafe 2 that is used uh, under the hood. And uh, at least I, for myself, couldn't really find the reason. And especially I'm not that a big expert on Cafe 2. I'm not an expert at all in Cafe 2. So I was kind of trying to figure that out. But at least that number I could not make any sense of. Okay, that didn't work. But we will see whether it will work in the future. I hope so. And I also yeah, expect it. But as I said, it's not only wrapping ONNX, it's also wrapping TensorFlow. So why not put TensorFlow into GraphPipe and use it there? Okay, so that doesn't work, but let's look into that case. Okay, so the same again, but of course, now we need to translate our model from its generic representation back to a TensorFlow representation. And this is what I mean by interoperability. If there are some people who like to work for PyTorch, let them work with PyTorch, please. And if there are some people who like to adhere to TensorFlow, that let them work with TensorFlow because there are solutions that make them translate between frameworks. And this is what we see here. So we have our ONNX model and we just take that TensorFlow connector because as I said, it's not yet fully integrated in TensorFlow, uh, call that prepare function, use our model so we just loaded it beforehand in ONNX, uh, tell it the device it should be used on, and then export it to the well-known protocol buffers that TensorFlow serving uses in order to serve its models. And then again, just get your TensorFlow serving Docker container, provide it uh, with a specific protocol buffer format of the model, and let it serve it, and that works. So we have a running web service that can now be queried and where we can now really get results and make it accessible for people to run their classifications on. Okay, so far to the GraphPipe part. But now as I touch TensorFlow serving, let's go into TensorFlow serving directly. And this is kind of the structure that is behind TensorFlow serving. So um, let me just quickly try to cover it. So you have that core that kind of confronts the client, which is coming with requests against us. And in the center, we have that manager. And that manager is responsible of um, the model lifetime we have. So it kind of keeps a different version we supply um, our server with. It kind of tracks these versions. It can uh, return 
client requests that kind of specify a specific version they want to see. And the dynamic manager then looks for that model, uses that specific version and returns the result of that specific version. So it's also great in order to compare different flavors of one model. If you would do some testing and see how the, um, how the performance compares to each other or how the accuracies are really in the wild. Um, and therefore it is um, kind of connected to a source, which might be a file system. And then you can just put your trained protocol buffer file uh, into that file system. The file system, the source then recognizes, okay, there's this new, new file, advises a so-called loader that is then responsible to load that model, inform the manager about that it has recognized a new model and waits for the resource resources to load that new model into the manager and then also keeps track of the of the versions themselves we will we will see that in a practical example uh, in two slides so um there are three steps towards that um, first, this is kind of verbose, and I did not really get it why you should do that if you have already provided uh, denominations of tensors beforehand, but you need to write or provide TensorFlow serving with proper signatures for prediction tasks or for classification tasks in, in, in particular that kind of just um, describe what the uh, inputs and outputs looks like, what their attached names should be um, that TensorFlow uses to reference them and so on. So a little verbose, but okay, let's go for it. Um, afterwards, you use that so-called saved model builder that then creates a further representation out of that protocol buffer. So this is already done by GraphPy before. Now we have to take care of it manually. And the last step seems quite, um, seems quite, um, yeah, known. So serve it within a Docker container. So and this is what we do here. So, um, we have our model pass. It's under TensorFlow MNIST. And there we have our file or our folder. Normally, the folder normally, um, carries as name the version. And within that, it sees the variables and, the, um, sorry and the model itself. And if I just put in a new folder denominated with a higher uh, version, then it just recognizes, hey, there's a new version. I have to load it and form the manager that I can load it, that I get the resources for it, load it, and then start serving from that. How does it look like? So many lines of code, but this is actually how it appeared to me. There are just a few points I want to cover here. So if we start that server, we already see um, okay, we are kind of reserving resources because we recognized a model file, um, successfully reserved resources to load the serverable, and serverable is kind of an abstract term for TensorFlow serving for everything that is model-like. It can be part of a model, it can be a single full model, it can also be a collection of models. We call it serverable in general. Um, and then we are, the loader is informing us about that it's uh, starting to load the serverable version. It's version one here. And then just after a few steps, we see, okay, that was successfully loaded. We now have the serverable version and we are now offering the service under that specific port and entering the event loop in which we receive requests from clients, serve that requests and yeah go on and on until we are kind of, uh, yeah, finished. So this is how TensorFlow serving works. So a little more verbose, um, but um, yeah, you see that nice structure. So I think they put a mod a much effort into, into, into that structure. So um, that seems still pretty nice. Now let's go even further and try to see how things look in behind or to understand things even better. And therefore I took the third approach, which goes about taking that representations um, and especially the generic representation from ONNX and let's build our own web server and, and Python Flask would be one of the things to go for that. So 
what we do is first we try to wrap the classifier into a model class that implements an inference method. What does that mean? Um, we use TensorFlow, TensorFlow itself under the hood and TensorFlow normally has to be within a session in order to perform an inference pass. So therefore we put also a session into that model class that up on instantiation is created and then ready to perform that inference passes against our model. So this is why we kind of build a wrapper that then we can directly call within each inference pass up on every request we receive from our clients. And then let's just build a minimalist front end. Please don't judge me on that. I'm a data scientist. I'm not a front end developer. Um, but I think this is always nice and easy to see, for example, to show to your colleagues or your customers, it depends, um, to just see how things work from the front end, how they can kind of interact with it, and then let people who are skilled enough do the nice job and build a nice front end around it. And then, of course, yeah, you have to implement the whole stuff. Um, this is how that looked like. So I just built a, um, a quick HTML template, uh, uh, um, which I then um, just applied, no, not applied, um, where I just have the capacity um, to choose a file from my file system, which I then can uh, use in order to create a POST request against my model server. So let's try to get the result. And this is how it looks like. Okay, I supplied an E. So this is the original image I supplied. And it was recognized correctly. And then you can also, for example, output the softmax scores in order to gain some, some knowledge about how confident the network is about the classification itself. So yeah, that works and it makes you think through these things a, a, a little more how you serve things. So I would not really recommend this for a really production system, but it sometimes helps to see how things work and how things are in a trend and what to think about and also to better understand what kind is of happening in GraphPipe or in TensorFlow itself. Okay, the last thing what I did is we have three approaches and uh, besides the qualitative part, let's also have a look into the quantitative part. So what I did for that is um, I focused on throughput and just try to see uh, how well the three approach uh, approaches um, perform compared with each other. Uh, for that, I used single instance requests first. So every time I have a request, I just send one flattened input image against uh, to the web server. Um, I did this locally because especially as you might have noticed here, sometimes internet is slow, sometimes it's fast. So this was why I just tried to have it locally to have a better comparison again uh, among these things. But as I said, you can also deploy it somewhere in the cloud and then query it there as you like. And what I tried to measure is the end-to-end -end throughput. So first step serialization, then you have the pre-processing part of the image on the server side. You have that main part, which is the inference pass across the network. You obtain your classification, you deserialize it, transport it back to your client, and let's see how fast things are there. So therefore, um, I used, um, I think it was 60 seconds, and let's see how many uh, we could achieve within that 60 seconds. So Flask wasn't that bad as expected, at least compared to GraphPipe, and TensorFlow excels them all, achieving almost 200 requests it performed during these, these 60 seconds. But maybe let's take a look more into the reality. So sometimes uh, in production systems, there might be really single requests you want to serve. But even if you uh, are kind of expecting more and more requests appearing to the yeah, approximately same time, you might go for batching. This is um, why I kind of simulated a uh, web server uh, or batching done at the web server side, which means that you could, for example, collect requests arriving within 10 milliseconds intervals, batch them, pass them through the network, and then serve them back. So therefore, I uh, adhered to what GraphPipe did in order to evaluate it. So they went for batches of 128 images. So, and there we can see a big difference. So now GraphPipe with TensorFlow under the hood excels them all, achieving approximately three times uh, 
um, three times the classifications that uh, TensorFlow serving uh, achieves. And even lower, we have it with uh, Flask here. So there, GraphPipe turns, to, turns out to be quite powerful and also consistent uh, to what the GraphPipe people did when they performed their throughput evaluation. I have to confess, I did this um, non-concurrently. Uh, they also uh, showed the case for concurrent, but it's kind of um, fuzzy because when they talk about concurrency here, they just used different uh, or more client threads in order to send requests against the server. So this is what they did here. So if we would like to compare it, we have to combine, compare blue bars with blue bars. So we just see GraphPipe also access very well there. Um, a lot better as TensorFlow serving and their own built Flask or their own built web service, which kinds of relates to Flask here. So yeah, this seems to be pretty, pretty nice. And I would really recommend try it out and um, go for it because yeah, this is what I found from my perspective. If you go for implementation effort, then using GraphPipe is pretty fast and it gets you pretty quickly out there with the running models that you can use. Of course, TensorFlow is a little more verbose, but uh, maybe this also has some usefulness. And of course, Flask was the most verbose, but this is nothing to our surprise. From the understandability point, I would say going for Flask or going for your own build web server might be reasonable in order to understand how things work better. Um, so yeah, and um, if you go for the, if you go for the speed, then we see graph pipe uh, access, especially in batch inference, you can go there for, for um, further evaluation. So just try out the, just try out the GitHub repo and try some things on your own, try different models or something like that. Um, but we also see that TensorFlow serving kind of excels when it comes to single requests, which might not be that unrealistically at all. Yeah, and what I hope for the future is that ONNX becomes even more supported, as I said, especially by TensorFlow. And um, yeah, I also hope that end-to-end -end data science taking deployment production into, into consideration from the very beginning becomes more widespread. And with this, I want to conclude, and thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Any questions? Thanks for sharing these insights, several useful concepts. One question from me, do you know how well these tools like uh, ONGS and GraphPipe work with other models? So let's say uh, cycled learn models or other not uh, non deep learning models um so at least to my knowledge i think it ONNX doesn't work uh, with scikit learn so it's really a neural network based translation format so um yeah, in order to have something working with scikit learn you would need to go for something else i, I don't think was there something out there but i would also say in the python community there is Cycled learn and nothing more with a big distance. So maybe some dedicated uh, things, for example, an NLP task like Spacey or Gansom. But when it comes to deep learning, there are really, at least for example, with PyTorch and TensorFlow, big frameworks out there that are really used a lot in the community. Any more questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, are you aware of any limitations uh, for this conversion between the different uh, formats, so between PyTorch and ONNX and ONNX and TensorFlow and so on? Um, there are. So um, as ONNX has kind of to grasp what every framework-specific language uses to, for example, formulate a convolution operation or a pooling operation or something like that, of course, they have to catch up how different frameworks do that and transfer it into an generic language. And um, they all not they are not, of course, supporting all these operations, framework specific operations. So I think currently they are also having difficulties with some pooling operations. Um, but 
as I see that big support there, as I see that community there, I would expect them to kind of catch up if things don't work, but are still kind of important. So you might run into issues if you use some complicated CNN structures or RNNs, that might be the case. And of course, I just used a simple DNN here, so I did not run into issues, but there might be some, yeah. Further questions? Okay. Then let's thank Marcel again for his great talk. Thank you.